If you've gotten a pile of terms of service changes email this week, you're not alone. We will explain why. Why one e-waste hero is going to jail. Is Apple Care worth it? And Movie Pass just got a little pricier. All that and more coming up on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Weekly, episode number 29, recorded on Thursday, April 26th, 2018. Welcome to the show. This Welcome. Is, this is the place where we like to talk about the news that broke this week. Sometimes we talk to the newsmakers. Sometimes we talk to the breakers. All the times it involves technology. Mm -hmm. It's in the name, mm -hmm. Tech News Weekly. I'm Jason yeah. Howell. I'm Megan Maroney. Are we ready to do this? Yeah. Talk about technology sure. and news and mm -hmm. stuff. Breaking, mm -hmm. making. Uh, I do a lot of reading in my daily life. I also do a lot of signing up for things online. But rarely do I do a lot of reading of terms of services when I sign up for things online because A, apparently I'm kind of lazy, and B, have you seen the terms of service on some of these sites? My eyes, anyways, I don't know about you, Megan, glaze over when I'm confronted with that like large wall of text, pages upon pages worth. And sure, I have myself to blame, but I'm certainly not alone in feeling like sometimes companies know this is going to happen and they slip things in there to capitalize on that. Joining us to talk about the terms of service reckoning, as he calls it, is Nate Langson from Bloomberg Businessweek. Welcome back to the show, Nate. Thanks very much for having me, guys. I, uh, I appreciate getting you on and I, I love that you, you call it the reckoning because that makes it sound so fatal although i don't know if it actually is but let's dive into it and see if that's the case uh you you start off your piece talking a little bit about paypal and uh how they're suspending hundreds of accounts and it kind of points back to the terms of service kind of an interesting angle what's going on there exactly yeah, it's interesting. Um, I mean, this story started out actually when I was looking into um, to this issue with PayPal. I'd sort of heard from a few people here in Europe, um, millennials, that they had had their accounts closed by PayPal um, because they were underage at the time that they signed up for the service. They were under 18. Part of the problem is that they're now in their late 20s. And so these closures have been happening about 10 years or so after their accounts initially opened. And the, they all came about by uh, PayPal asking them for some ID because they were trying to move some, you know, money, legitimate money, you know, out to the account. They needed proof of ID. They noticed, PayPal that is, noticed that they were underage when they signed up a decade ago and said they were going to close the account and, and what have you. So it was very, very bizarre. But then during the congressional hearings um, with Mark Zuckerberg, the other week, I, there was uh, one of the sen senators had sort of waved this giant stack of papers um, at Zuckerberg and said, you know, I'm a lawyer and I don't understand this, you know, or words to that effect, sort of talking about the fact that these terms and conditions are just gigantic, full of legalese. No one pays attention to them. And Zuckerberg said that he doesn't think people actually pay attention to these. And when I went back to PayPal, they the only thing that they told me is that they close these accounts in order for people to be able to legally accept the terms and conditions. But PayPal's terms and conditions are currently about 60,000 words long. You know, so that's longer than The Great Gatsby. It's twice as long as uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm. You know, it's longer than many very popular novels. And it just made me think that this is a huge issue, but it's also a huge issue just about time before we move into what's called GDPR, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit, but it's essentially new regulations in Europe about data protection. But there's a big element of that around user consent, um, which directly relates to terms and conditions. So I sort of packaged all this up into one piece to sort of really step back and say, wow, you know, this has been having a real effect on people um, in this new way that we're sort of learning about with PayPal. But more broadly speaking, this is probably not something that's going to be able to happen legally in future for European citizens. So what's the solution to this problem, though? Because, I mean, you know, we all know we can't have nice things because people do bad things with nice things. So you have <laughs> to have some sort of, uh, you know, there have to be terms of con and conditions. There has to be, uh, there, and, and they almost have to be that long. It's just the world that we live in. So, so what's the solution? 
Well, I mean, part of the argument is that they don't have to be that long. Um, and and really, it comes down to the sort of the classic kiss rule. Keep it simple, stupid. You know, it's it's about it's about making things understandable to the average person. So PayPal may have 60,000 words in its current terms of service. But, you know, the vast majority of that a probably isn't relevant to most people and b the bits that are relevant are not necessarily that easy to understand. So the idea is that these terms and conditions should be made much more understandable, you know, break them down, make it easy for people to understand. If they need to read into more detail, offer that. No one's saying that these terms and conditions should completely disappear and go away legally. You know, as, as you say, they they need to be there to protect people and to protect businesses. But that sort of that moment that you're giving consent for things like your data to be uh, uh, processed, um, for example, or for your money to be held by a, you know, by a company, you have to, under GDPR, be able to give informed consent, or rather a company has to show that a user gave informed consent for their data or money or whatever it is to be processed. And it cannot be considered informed if you have to plow through 60,000 words of legalese. So the, the way that this will have to work is a balance that users will have to be able to generally understand what they're being signed up to or what terms they're being held to um, when using a service. And a company has to be able to say that they tried their best to make sure it was understood um, and then it's OK. And then the terms and conditions can still be lengthy behind that if needs be. But at least they can say, well, a user was informed enough to give their consent for their data to be used. Yeah, standardizing this in a way that like like in my head, I envision headings and subheadings that are collapsible to be, give you the broad sense of what this particular part is about. And then if you really want to dive in there and get even more detailed information, you can. But that, I guess that's a lot to ask and, and format for all the companies that are doing this, not to mention companies probably to at least a certain degree are okay with the fact that this stuff is confusing, right? Like in doing so, in, in making it so dense, uh, people might be more inclined to do what they're doing now, which is just to say, well, I want into here and I, and I realize I should probably read through this, but I just, I want in here, so I'm going to do it anyways. And the company could stand to gain a lot from that. Yeah. And, and you know, what's interesting about this is that this isn't really a new issue. You know, this has been going on for a very, very long time. There was a very interesting case, which I did include in the piece back in 2005, where a software security company um, put a line in its terms and conditions that essentially said, if somebody spots this line and tells us about it, um, you'll win a prize. And, <laughs> and someone did four months later and they got a thousand dollars. And it sort of proved that it took thousands of downloads of a piece of software and four months for just one person to come forward and say, hey, I read your EULA and I saw this thing about a prize. Can I have it, please? Um, and there's some really weird ones as well. If you Google um, Amazon Web Services, um, living flesh, put that actual term in, it sounds weird, but there's um, one of the terms of service in AWS for a specific bit of the um, the software that you can use there actually has a clause in it that references how, uh, I think it's something like the software can't be used for certain things in the instance that um, there's an apocalypse and uh, the, the dead rise up and try and consume living human flesh or something like that. I'm not kidding. It's it's in there if you Google it. It's been widely covered and actually got cut out of my feature. But, um, you know, this has just been going on for a very long time. And it's it's just a it's kind of got to a bit of a crunch now with GDPR. But uh, I've got off on a bit of a tangent. But what I was going to say is that <laughs> I, I like this tangent, by the way, because yeah. I was living very flesh unclear. will do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> there's, uh, it's easy to go on a tangent with with zombies, but um, there's um, there was one uh, sort of uh, kind of an analyst and expert in in legal proceedings that I spoke to around this, and I sort of asked him like, <clears throat> what's a really good solution? You know, what can a company do in order to try and say, look, we did our best. We've got to have these terms, but we tried to give people informed consent. And one of the ideas he said is that you could sort of walk people through an initial set of terms and they have to understand each each bit you know do you understand this do you understand this do you understand this you know kind of like one of those capture things and you you say yes 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 
And then you can sort of say, well, you gave informed consent. They tried their best. The problem to that, obviously, is that that's a major roadblock if you're trying to encourage quick signups and conversions. So there's going to be this balanced middle ground where companies don't want to put up a giant roadblock like a huge registration form or giant sets of terms and all this kind of stuff. But at the same time, they have to be able to show that they did their best to clearly explain, um, you know, what data is going to be used for in order for someone to give to give their consent. Hmm. So informed consent is the is it what's at issue here? And there's a difference yeah. between um, terms of con- terms and conditions and a privacy policy, and sometimes we confuse them. But a privacy policy is uh, you're not giving informed consent to that. Like we just say, like read, make sure you read the privacy policy. But then if you if if you find out something in it and you want to you know bring a case against them for that, if it's not part of the terms and conditions that you've signed. So, so is that one, um, one way of getting around this, just using, putting these things in the privacy policy so that we are uh, informed but not giving our consent? Well, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a yes answer and a no answer to that. And, and part of the problem is that GDPR isn't in force yet. And companies so far have sort of been reluctant to show their hand up until as recently as this week to say we are GDPR compliant and we have updated our terms and all this sort of thing. So we're not we haven't yet really seen loads of examples of how companies are going to get around this. Um, But the bottom line is that, you know, the difference between informed consent and 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 consent is that, you know, it's very simple. You you you, the idea of a pre-ticked checkbox to say you've read something or, or or agreed to something just cannot happen anymore, you know, because, you know, that is sort of an assumption that you've given consent. You can blindly click something and not realize you've agreed to something that will just have to go away. You know, that just won't won't do. Things have to be clearer. You can't have you know, pre-tick checkboxes and things like that. And it's going to have to be much, much more easy to understand up front before you agree to give any of your data away. Yeah, maybe um, I, I realize you were talking about, you know, these barriers that potentially prohibit someone from wanting to sign up, but maybe you quiz them. Wouldn't that be fun? You go to a site, you read the terms of service, you can't get in here until you take a quiz and tell yeah. us no that wouldn't be fun at all what doesn't uh, what doesn't make me feel very good about the the possibilities that surround this is the correlation to what we already experience with permissions on smartphones right like we're constantly in this in this state of not truly understanding exactly what apps have access to, even though we've explicitly said, yes, you can have access to my camera. Or yes, you can have access to the contacts. And that's a much simpler, I feel like, kind of uh, delivery of of what we're saying okay to. Uh, you know, the permissions when we install an app is kind of already doing what we're talking about here. It's got a, you know, it's got a, a header that says contacts. And then there's a little bit more information about it, but it's still very obscure. And yet we still say, okay, even though something like you know, Cambridge Analytica or who knows what else uh, happens. So it doesn't really give me a whole lot of, of positive thoughts of as far as the, the possibilities here. What do you think? Yeah, that? that's definitely true. I mean, you know, one of the big differences between between that and, and, you know, what's happening with GDPR is that with the permissions on a device, you know, accessing your camera, you know, that's fairly, it's fairly simple. You, you know what you're getting, you know, it does, yeah. as we old term in Britain, it does what it says on the tin, you know, we know that okay, you're accessing my camera because you need to take pictures or you need my contacts because this is a social app. That's fine. But with with services and with networks and with uh, financial companies, there's so much more that they can do with your information, your data. You know, who's it being shared with? What companies is it being shared with? Do you have a right to revoke those permissions? Where's the data being stored? You know, all of this stuff is what's um, made possible under GDPR for somebody to get access to. You know, they, they will have... A, a maximum companies that is will have a maximum of 30 days to respond to a request giving you information about where your data is stored literally you know the location the, the country that it's in what companies have access to it what companies have had access to it in addition to obviously all the data itself and then you can request to have the whole lot wiped completely and if they don't comply with this or other um failures to comply with this are punishable by up to four percent of your global sales, you know, which is just a gigantic amount of money. You know, you think about how much that is for the likes of Google and Facebook. And it's why they have hundreds, probably thousands of people working on this um, now. You know, there's no there's kind of no wiggle room here. They've they've got to get it right. 
So what responsibility lies with the company itself? Using your PayPal example, the, the woman who is 26 now signed up to use the service when she was 16. They didn't check that. They didn't prove that then. So where, how, how much of this uh, lies in the companies itself to enforce those types of terms of services and service and not wait a decade to enforce them? Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, in the PayPal example, you know, I didn't want to be, you know, crazy harsh on them because in the, the day, what they were doing was, was essentially totally in their rights. You know, the, it was a user who signed up underage. The terms did say that they couldn't sign up before they were 18, and yet they did. And so Facebook, uh, PayPal shut down the account. You know, what, what was kind of maddening for these people is that it was 10 years later, and they'd obviously given PayPal a lot of fees and things in the, in the meantime. Um, but it, it kind of means that... Um, that companies will still be able to act on uh, breaches of a, of terms and conditions. You know, it will be separate from that age gate sort of policy. Like they they don't have to necessarily say we have to put in these age checks or some kind of identification procedure in order to make sure that you're complying with the terms. They just have to make sure that they've made it clear at the point you sign up what those rules are. After that, you know, if you break those rules, if you break your side of those um, of, of that agreement, then you know the same process can can happen. The, the only different, the only real difference is, is that a user will have um, a better defense to say, well, look, this is sixty thousand words of legalese. You know, how was I supposed to read this and understand this? How could I give informed consent? You know, I was just giving consent. It wasn't informed because how can I understand all this? That's kind of the key difference here. Um, so. It'll be it'll be separate from age checks. It'll be separate from a lot of stuff, but um, it's just going to have to be very, very clear to a user what they're agreeing to. Yeah. Um, they can still break it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Nate Langson with Bloomberg. Really appreciate you taking time, uh, especially out of your late evening to join us on the show today. Uh, where, where do you want people to follow all the stuff you're doing online? Yeah, well, I mean, Twitter is the is the best uh, the best place at Nate Langson N A T E L A N X O N. I um I post links to all my stuff uh, that I write for Bloomberg and 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 uh, for my own podcast there as well. And and I've just posted a link to that feature in case anyone wants to check the link and uh, and read that. Awesome, Nate. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll talk to you thank soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nate. All right, take care, Nate. We have asked you all to send us your selfies. And, and you, have, you have. You have And complied. you continue to. Yes. Uh, Matthew <laughs> sent us this selfie. He said he listens while he's at work. He adds that he uses headphones so as not to disturb his coworkers. <laughs> and I would like to know why he thinks his coworkers would find us disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think take off those headphones. I think everyone uh, should get to listen. Yeah, sure. Uh, maybe that's what Steve uh, from Flower Mound uh, is doing. He says that he watches on his laptop, and I'm not sure that I see a headphone in the headphone jack. Of course, this might not be the office, so yeah, it probably that doesn't looks matter. like home, yeah. Flower Mound, Texas, outside of Dallas. Ah, okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's a place warm in my heart, Flower oh, okay. Mound. And finally, Maya from Slovenia. She says, here's a brutally honest answer on what we're doing while listening to TNW in our house. I'm currently enjoying <laughs> a long European maternity leave and rely on you guys, among others, to keep me up to date. Thanks for your work and dedication. Maya nice. is feeding her baby and she does not look sleep deprived at all. She looks very joyful. Um just glowing, I would say. <laughs> I would say so too. And congratulations. Yes, thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> for sending those in. TNW at twit.tv if you want to hop on that train. Electronic waste is a problem. We may not see the effects of e-waste firsthand, but when our technology is no longer operational and it gets discarded, all those metals and toxic chemicals can end up in landfills around the world, much to the detriment of our environment. One man, Eric, uh, man named Eric Lundgren uh, had a plan to help reduce that e-waste by fixing broken cell phones and electronics and making them work again, which sounds great, uh, but maybe not so much because he's headed to federal prison for 15 months. And joining us to tell his story uh, is Tom Jackman from The Washington Post. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hi, guys. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we've got you coming through loud and clear and awesome uh, video as well. We thank you for joining us today. <laughs> 
Thank you so Welcome much. Welcome to my Rana. guest room. Excellent. It's a very nice guest room. <laughs> yes. We could probably key go. out the green walls and put you in space, but we won't. <laughs> no right. ideas, Josh. Don't do that. Uh, let's start with uh, Eric's California-based company uh, when it was processing all that e-waste to begin with. What exactly was his, uh, his business doing and providing for customers? They uh, are hired by big corporations to recycle computers and all sorts of electronics but prior to that, uh, they, he was in China and attempting to learn about how e-waste, you know, flows from the U.S. through Central America to China to Africa to various places. And one of the things he was doing in China was uh, sending parts to extend the life of computers, little screws, uh, you know, little sprockets, backs of things, uh, things that would just keep our electronics running and keep them out of landfills. And there are some amazing pictures of him at, you know, really horrible landfills in Africa, in Ghana particularly, uh, where they just burn the stuff and destroy the air as well as the ground. So that's what he was doing when he got involved in a plan uh, to uh, extend the life of PCs by distributing the restore disks. Uh, and you want to jump in on that? Well, so, okay, I, I learned a lot through reading uh, your articles. You posted back in February when this was kind of still in, in process and then very recently with this article a few days ago uh, with the verdict. But I learned a, a little something about these these repair disks and how refurbishing, you know, with these repair disks, kind of how that business works. But I, I will agree or admit that it was a little confusing getting in to really kind of wrap my head around. So how is this supposed to work when you're talking about refurbishing machines and you've got repair disks, Microsoft Windows repair disks, how is it supposed to work? And then we can talk about how he differed from that, I suppose. It's supposed to work that uh, when you get a computer, it comes with a disk. And so if your hard drive crashes and you need to restore the operating system, you do it with the disk. And if you lose the disk, you can download the operating system from Dell or, uh, you know, any of the other computer manufacturers, they, they included a disk uh, for many years. We all used to buy computers that came with these disks. We stuck them in a folder. We never used them again. Yep, I remember those. But uh, now they don't even include the disk. They just put the restore part on a separate part of the hard drive. Uh, so anyway, while the disks were still a part of the original package, uh, Eric had the idea to supply these to people who had lost them and to supply them to refurbishers. Uh, so that uh, people could extend the lives of their computers or people buying a used computer would be able to, to buy a, a worthwhile used computer as opposed to it getting thrown out because the operating system was gone. Hmm. I mean, I understand that there, this is a copyright issue. He was making lots of copies. He was selling something for a low price, we should say, um, that was otherwise free. But but going back to what you were saying about how he was concerned about e-waste uh, in China and Africa and just looking at like, the poisons that we're sending overseas uh, because of our relentless desire for technology. And I blame my, you know, I'm as guilty as the next person here. Why such a harsh penalty? Like, why, why not just a fine? Why does he have to go to prison? Prison. Microsoft says that they want to discourage people from counterfeiting their software and a making money off of it. Although Eric Lundgren says I wasn't going to make any money off this. This was really more of a public service. I was selling these for a quarter to refurbishers to give to people. Uh, and so he had no real profit motive as opposed to extending the life of computers. But Microsoft says, look, uh, we don't want unauthorized people distributing this software and we don't know what's in the software it could have malware in it that could screw up people's computers down the road so you you know you buy a used computer and this uh, restore disk wasn't an authorized disk uh, nobody's accused Lundgren of doing that but uh, it could contain malware and uh, it could mess up people's computers it would be blamed on Microsoft's you know software but it wasn't their fault so that so Microsoft got involved and claimed that there was financial loss to them uh, of $25 per disc, even though uh, he was selling them for 25 cents because they say that's what we sell the discs to, to refurbishers, to official licensed refurbishers. They pay $25 to 
put that operating system on a used computer. Uh, Lundgren argues, look, that that operating system was already on there. The user, original user, can download it for free. So why do they have to pay? Again, why should anyone have to pay? And this argument continues to this day. Yeah, that's that's one one of the 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 facts that I kind of learned about how this all works from your article is that the discs themselves have no actual license. In selling the disc, you're not actually selling a license. What they enable is for the the computer that you have that does have a license for you to bring that OS back on. So I can I can totally see where where Lundgren was coming from. At the same time, there is the flip side of that, which is you know the the fact that he was copying these discs and distributing them potentially in mass, you know, in massive amounts. And, you know, I would look at that from the outside and be like, yeah, I probably wouldn't do that if I were you. That that seems like a really bad idea, even though his intentions were were awesome. And I mean, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about the good that he and his company have done. You know, just one example, donating 14,000 cell phones and $100,000 uh, to cell phones for soldiers, uh, doing all sorts of work, you know, in, in other countries where there are these landfills and, and all that kind of stuff. Did that hold any sway with the judge as far as the penalty that was given? Like, could it have been a more severe penalty had that background not been there? Absolutely. The penalty was supposed to be something like, uh, 30 to 36 months, and the judge uh, cut him a break. The government asked asked for that penalty. I think it was a 36-month sentence that the judge cut down to 15 months, uh, in part because uh, he didn't, Lundgren sold little or none of these discs. They were seized. When he shipped them from China to Florida, they got intercepted by uh, customs. And so there wasn't really a financial loss there. It was sort of an estimate of what the loss would have been. Right. And so uh, he, he did get credit for the good work he's done. And his company does have big clients to this day that they recycle tens of thousands of computers. They do things. They, they save battery. They recycle batteries. Uh, he built an electric car that outpaced a Tesla. He's done a lot of really neat things uh, attempting to keep the stream of e-waste to a manageable level. How likely is there uh, for an appeal in this case? He says it's done. He says they're done. Uh, so he did appeal it. He got sentenced to this amount. He, he had pleaded guilty and thought, well, I won't get any jail time because I didn't cause anyone any financial loss. I didn't cause any financial loss, so I won't get jail time. He got jail time, so he appealed that to the 11th Circuit in Florida. They... Uh, gave him the jail time. He could appeal that. You initially get a three-judge panel. He could appeal that to the full court, but he doesn't think that that will work, and so he is preparing to surrender. No more appeal. Yeah, and it sounds like he's just basically said, "I've, I've you know, I've come to terms with the fact that I'm going to prison. I'm going to be doing time. However, his company is still in operation and is going to still, you know, he's, he's tying up the financial aspects of that uh, for while he is uh, in prison. And, uh, you know, it's, it sounds, sounds like from, from your article that really what he hopes at the end of the day that, that this does is kind of shines up more of a light on the, the problem of, of e-waste that we have. And I mean, that, uh, admittedly, that's, that's exactly part of the right. reason why I reached out for you, because I think it's a noble that's cause. Right. He, and, and also, he was under the sincere belief that he was distributing something that was free. Yeah. It's freeware, so why can't I give it to somebody? He said to me once, if I send you a link to, you know, Adobe's website because they're offering a good deal on, uh, you know, Acrobat, does that mean that I am you know, conspiring against Adobe because I sent you that link? And... Uh, so he thought he did not think that he was doing anything sleazy by redistributing. He thought he was making it easier for people who otherwise couldn't do it, who wouldn't download an operating system. Well, here it is. It's out there for you for free. I'm providing it to you. Right. Providing a service to make it easier so that that doesn't end up in a landfill somewhere. Uh, Tom Jackman, it's really nice to meet you. And we really appreciate you uh, coming on the show to, to talk about uh, your post uh, at the Washington it's fun Post. fun to be here. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Where can people follow all of your work online? Or, uh, do you have a Twitter account that you want to plug? At WashingtonPost.com slash true crime. And I'm on Twitter at uh, Tom Jackman WP. Awesome. Thanks again, Tom. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Sure. Thanks, Tom.
Apple held its education event about a month ago now, and I am still hearing from you all out there, educators, parents, and others who enjoy arguing over what's better for schools, Chromebooks or iPads. Unless you're one, the one making the decision for your school district, chances are you'll have no say in the matter. This week, we wanted to talk to someone who is in charge of making those decisions. Welcome, Bradley Chambers. Thanks, Megan. I'm glad to be here. Bradley covers Apple and education for 9to5Mac. He's also been managing Apple devices in an education environment since 2009. And you write a weekly piece on 9to5Mac about how Apple could do a better job for students. And uh, this week's column really caught my eye. You write that Apple Care Plus is a horrible investment for schools. Tell us why. Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of discussion among like personal people. Um, like is, is Apple care for my iPhone a good deal? Is it not? You know, what is that? $69 a lot of times. That's not a huge investment. When you're talking about, you know, buying hundreds, if not thousands of iPads, that is a lot of money. And so I started looking at the, the various SKUs on the Apple education store and I can buy a 10 pack of the sixth generation uh, iPad, the 32 gigabyte, that is $2,940, so $2,940. I can buy it with um, uh, th three years of Apple Care for $3,730. So that's $790 difference over 10 iPads. Okay, let's do, let's say I buy, you know, 100 iPads or 1,000 iPads. That Apple Care price goes up exponentially. Okay, so let's just like run the math on a thousand iPads, which is not a small deployment, but it's not necessarily the biggest. There are certainly bigger ones. Um, that would be, if you've got Apple Care Plus on all thousand iPads, that would be uh, $79,000. That's a lot of money. Additional 79,000. Additional on top of the iPad cost. Right. And the thing is like, if you crack your screen, it's not a free repair. Mm. It's $49, like a, like an insurance deductible. So, you start running the math on like, what is my damage rate over the lifetime of these devices? And so I started, you know, and I've never been a big fan of Apple Care for like enterprise type deployments because again, you can self-insure at that rate. Um, and I started looking you know, and kind of running the math and y you had to have a screen damage rate of around 40% before Apple Care Plus becomes like financially viable. Hmm. And I know at my school, we've had iPads since the beginning. And I've probably seen a one to two percent damage rate. And I know all schools are different. And but I, I'll say if you're seeing a damage rate among f around forty percent, <laughs> um, you've got other problems. Than I mean that your whole this your whole setup was wrong. Um, because again, you can you know you can, if you have a, if I have a screen that gets cracked, I can take that to uh, and get it repaired for two hundred forty nine dollars. Now again, I'm getting close to the cost of the you know, what the, you know, iPad cost. But again, if you just run the math, uh, you come out way better. A again, unless you're above 40%, uh, not buying Apple care. And so, so my advice to, to most schools is like, look, if you really think you need Apple care, take the amount that Apple care would cost you and just set it aside. You know, if you, if it's going to be, you know, $80,000, Set aside a third of that every year for repairs. And if you need it, that's great. But if you don't, then you didn't spend it. Because uh, again, Apple Care Plus, that is a profit game for Apple. And they're betting that you're not going to have any issues and you betting you, you are. And again, I'm just not seeing that. The other schools I've talked to, you're just not seeing damage rates near that high. And what uh, one thing that you point out in your article, uh, as far as Apple Care is concerned, is it's not just about screen damage, let's say. Obviously, that's probably the thing that most people buy insurance or Apple Care for uh, to begin with is because we've all, you know, probably all of us, I know I've done it a couple of times, dropped our devices, screen shatters, and you have to, you know, pony up to get the display replaced. That's not cheap. But there are other aspects to Apple Care. And you point out in the, in the article that most schools aren't going to be using the software support aspects of Apple Care, which is, a, is another incentive for, let's say, uh, general consumers with Apple Care. What do you mean by by that why, why would schools not benefit from that well because again generally um if you're in a situation where you have a thousand ipads at your school you probably have someone that's an it expert that that is their job and so they're not just going to pick up the phone like if they're having an issue they're not going to pick up the phone you know with like you know getting you know calling general apple care support about how to you know delete their mail account that's <laughs> you generally would know how to, if you're in that job 
you generally like know how to do that at that point. That, and that's, I mean, typically people come to you for those kind of solutions. And so again, if you're a school that is buying a thousand iPads and you don't have someone on site that is your local, you know, quote unquote, Apple care expert, then you, you should have hired someone before you bought devices. Yeah, that makes sense. So what kind of uh, protection do you do you make you know, the, the students in your schools that you manage? What do, do they have like a giant? I know my kids have one of those giant iPad cases on their school issued iPads. What do you use? I find you're going to think this is crazy. I find the absolute cheapest case I can buy. Um, because, again, if you start dropping 50 bucks on a case times a thousand iPads, yeah. you've got a lot of money in cases. And so I, I always find these little cheap cases on Amazon my only caveat is I need the back kind of I, I get them like it's the uh, the off brand, uh, you know, like the Apple ones that have the back part and then they open and it, and it unlocks it. I can't remember what those are called, but um, I, I just want the back part to cut, have a little bit of a lip because mm -hmm. so just in case it you know was set flat you know on the ground, it wouldn't scratch it necessarily or keep it off the ground. But we and we even find like and we don't we stress to the kids like these are breakable, these cost a lot of money. Uh, if you are negligible with them, we may ask your parents to pay for them. And, and so we stress about how they need to be taken care of. And I know every school can't do that. I mean, I'm in a private school. And so we can, you know, we can have different kind of conversations about money at a public school. You might not be able to. But in my experience, the more you act like the iPads are indestructible because of your cases or we have this great entrance program. So if you break them, it's, you're, nobody's adding the money. Kids don't take care of them. And the more you act like, hey, these things are valuable, these things can be broken, these things are expensive, kids generally take a you know, little bit better, better, better care of them. I know my kids take really good care of their iPads at home because they know if they break them, they don't have one anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I, I know that feel too. Um, I, I think it's really smart what you point out in your article uh, about kind of setting self-insuring setting aside the money up front which i'm sure if you did the math on the on the you know the the rate of, of devices that require a replacement and you added that up and instead of you know the money that you were originally planning to put in apple care you put in i think you pointed out like in your example twenty five thousand dollars into a self-insuring uh, ins insuring fund so that as need be you can pull from there to make your replacements and everything but what kind of interference uh, might you run into if you're creating that fund because some of this money is coming from different places that might have different rules around it. Yeah, that's true because if you have, say, grant money where it has to be used for, towards devices, just buy more devices. Because yeah. again, if you're if you're buying Apple Care, you know, I can buy a sixth generation iPad for $300 essentially. Um, if I'm buying Apple Care um, Plus on 10 iPads, instead of buying the Apple Care Plus, I could just buy two more iPads. And so, yeah, for every 10, I've got two spares. Right. That sort of goes against what we were talking about in our last segment about <laughs> e-waste. But I get what you mean. <laughs> I get you. We're not the, you know, kids' iPads are not the biggest problem um, in e-waste. But so my my uh, my school, I, it's a public school. They got uh, iPads issued a couple years ago. I didn't like the idea. And I've had to pay for two because, and I think you're right. It's that they had those giant cases. And so they think they're indestructible. Um, but so, so what do you suggest? Because I, you know, I don't like, do I just call up the person who manages IT for the school system and say, and ask if they use Apple Care? Because I'd hate to know that they were wasting the taxpayer's money. What do you suggest? How do you suggest uh, trying to tell someone who has your job how to do their job better? <laughs> well, it, <laughs> if it's at a, a private school or independent school, just pick them up and call them, you know, and ask them. And uh, if, if it's not an answer you like, uh, I'll offer some reasons why. And, at, you know, a public institution, I would maybe look at, you know, trying to form some sort of technology committee just to help provide some some oversight there. And some, you know, it may be where the, there's like, you know, one person or two people for the entire district and they're so scrapped for time and they're just running around rampant that they don't even think about that. They just, okay, let's, of course, we're getting the warranties. Let's buy it all, you know, running through. Uh, and just may, maybe just say, hey, let's talk about that. Could we just buy more iPads instead of uh, giving you know, spending the money on Apple Care? Because again, that's going right to Apple's bottom line. I promise you, they make a fortune off Apple Care Plus. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't offer it. Mm -hmm. And so, has your school ever used Chromebooks or MacBooks or laptops? Yeah, we we've got um, in our in our uh, library we have uh, the desktop version of the Chromebook, which is like they call it a Chromebox, really really good uh, device. Now, I love both devices. I think they both are have their merits. Uh, in lower school education, I really think the iPad provides a lot of value that um, 
the Chromebook doesn't uh, in terms of just the focus curriculum, the reinforcement of various things. The app store is Apple's kind of Achilles uh, or not Achilles heel, but Trojan horse into education. They, there's so much there on the app store that there's just not there on the Chrome web store, even just searching Google. A good example, the example I use is if I have a second grade teacher that wants to reinforce uh, place value in math, there are countless really great applications uh, for the iPad or on the, the Chromebook, you're just searching random websites. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I do think as you get older, Apple's advantages go down and the Chromebooks really go up, uh, especially as you get into more research papers and report writing. Um, I, you know, my big argument uh, with Apple's current state of, of K-12 education is really nothing about the iPad. And it's really nothing about the Chromebook. Apple's biggest weaknesses is that uh, it's iCloud versus G Suite, and G Suite is winning. There, you know, there really is no uh, version of iCloud for schools where you can do an end-to-end -end software to hardware ecosystem. There's no way, you know, like our school has been using G Suite, which is Google's enterprise email system since 2010. So you know, we have student emails, we have staff emails. That's the first thing they get. We're heavily uh, invested into Google Drive, Google Docs. It's all very ingrained in our workflows. And Apple just doesn't have anything similar. There's no way for me to use like an iCloud for schools uh, system where I can uh, have all of our kids using our email and using iCloud Drive and, 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 and using pages and syncing everything. I mean, they have some pieces of that, but it's really just an add-on I because mean, it doesn't have an email e you know, ecosystem. And the rumor is it was on um, back the day of the event. It was leaked for an hour on one of their IT pages in Australia, oddly enough where coming uh, this winter, which I believe will be this this summer for U.S. schools, that iCloud will be, all, their um, Apple School Manager ecosystem will be offering sync to G Suite and Microsoft's uh, Azure Active Directory. That was later pulled down. Um, I, I, I think that got, probably got leaked a little early. So it looks like they're going to be offering a way to sync your, your G Suite system with their iCloud system, how you do managed Apple IDs. You know, I, it's better than nothing. My problem is, is I feel like it's disingenuous for Apple to stand on stage at the education event and talk about their privacy stance and then really just punt the identity management system to a company that they kind of, you know, dog a little bit for how they handle privacy. Now, obviously mm -hmm. in K-12, Google handles things way differently than they do with your regular Gmail account. We have very strict contracts, how they don't mine our data. We don't have advertising. But, I, but again, I think if Apple wants to want schools to be all in on iPad, they need to be all in on services. And I don't think that the battle is iPad versus um, Chromebook. It's it's iCloud versus G Suite. And iCloud just didn't hadn't come up to play yet. And I don't know, it doesn't seem like that's anything that Apple's interested in. And the longer they wait, the more that schools are becoming heavily entrenched into uh, G Suite. And that's, you know, a lot of people talk about Chromebooks and, and it's, oh, it's all about the cheapest device. Yes, Chromebooks are inexpensive uh, compared to the iPad, but the reason that the Chromebooks have done so well has doesn't have as much to do with price as it does how easy it is to deploy and manage and it's it's integrated in with your existing identity system. Uh, schools are swimming in too many logins. Like we've got a login for this, we've got an account for this. And Google is really kind of helping with that because it's like, hey, you had this device, it's already, you know, you already just use your email system to log in. There's nothing else to learn. But with Apple, it's, you know, iCloud accounts for education are a whole other system to manage. And that's frankly something that IT administrators are looking to get what well, they want less of. They want less systems to manage. And Google's really, you know, kind of winning there. So we know how you feel about this, you being a grown up. <laughs> uh, how do the kids feel about kind of the differences between them having iPads for their work versus them having Chromebooks for their work? Do they have any strong feelings? I'm sure they do. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think it really depends. You know, one of the things I have noticed, uh, I'll give you a good example. One of the things our fifth grade class was doing this year is they were starting to learn about uh, stock buying and, and trading. And so to kind of make that work could hit home for a lot of them, they used the ESPN uh, quarterback rating system. So they got a certain amount of uh, um, points to spend on week one. And then they could kind of, as the as the quarterbacks went up and down, they, could, they wanted to see how much they had, you know, quote unquote, made. Well, we did all this in Google spreadsheets on the iPad. And I think they realized like how limited things like that were on the iPad. I mean, Google Spreadsheets is a really poor experience uh, on the iPad. So I think in like that situation, they would have drastically preferred a a Chromebook because again, unless you have external keyboards, when you pull up that keyboard, you have a really small screen to work with at that point. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Uh, I, I, you know, again, I think they both have their advantages, uh, particularly depending on what grade you're looking in, um, but. You know, iCloud or Apple's got a lot of work to do on the services side to keep people interested in the iPad and the education. Mm. 
Well, Bradley, we have to have you back because uh, I want to talk about keyboards with the iPad. That's a whole other conversation. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on. Bradley Chambers writes a weekly column for 9 to 5 Mac. Where mm -hmm. else can people follow uh, your work online? Uh, I'm on Twitter at, at Bradley Chambers, and I have a blog. It's uh, called ChambersDaily.com. And then, like you said, I write a weekly column for 9 to 5 Mac. Uh, it comes out every Saturday called Making the Grade. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, us. Bradley. Thank you. The Movie Pass Unlimited Movies deal might be coming to an end. Oh. And now the Movie Pass apocalypse. Uh, the Hollywood Reporter says Movie, movie Pass Pop hasn't no. offered the deal, the unlimited deal, since April 13th. Now, if you already signed up, you're still good for now. Uh, but if you want to sign up now, if you didn't get the deal, now $9.99 a month includes only four movies a month with Movies Pass, plus an extended free three-month iHeartRadio all-access trial. Oh, okay. <laughs> which is the same as seeing movies the rest of the days of the month. Uh, you'll also be billed for the full three-month month plan at sign-up and then billed quarterly afterwards. And read the fine print because my movie pass is going to get all kinds of personal information, location information, et cetera, uh, when you sign up. And if you're okay with that, I think $10 a month for four movies it's still a relatively good deal. It's not a ridiculously super duper amazeballs good deal, like a free mo a movie included every single day of the week of for the rest of your life. Yeah, probably not for the rest of your life. They're I probably going to change year. that at some point. Yeah, I think it was probably well, maybe it was a year, but I mean, yeah. I think like it's 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 the idea of going to a movie yeah. every day. But yeah, you know, but are you really? I right. mean, there are some people. There are the outliers that actually do that. They're like, you know what? Yes, mm -hmm. you said I can, and it's like my my most favorite thing is watching a movie in the movie theater. Uh, I have a friend who probably f fits in that category. Is it uh, me? It's not not <laughs> as far as I know, because then I'd have two friends that, that fall in that category. Um, but apparently, so I was reading through some of the statistics uh, from the article. The subscriptions jumped from twenty thousand users when they were offering. Uh, this at a $50 per month plan to 2 million users when they switched, I think it was October, to the nine ninety five dollars per month plan. So that's a huge jump. Their, their original plan was to reach 5 million users by this year's end. So it'll be interesting to see if this change slows that down because, I mean, there, there was... I, I think there was momentum. There was certainly a lot of people talking about it, but, uh, you know, yet again, it was amazing value but yet I still didn't sign up for it, even though it's like an incredible value. And right, even if you just went once. Yeah, even if you once. just went once, like, yeah. Um, so I did sign up. There's a, a competing uh, service called Cinemia with an S, S-I-N-E-M-I-A. And I signed up for it for research, of course. Um, and Are you going to review it? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> I am. Uh, I signed up for the cheapest plan, which is five ninety nine a month for one ticket once a month. <laughs> so Five. I'm really only saving like, but it's like $13 to go see a movie. Yeah. Right. So I'm saving, you know, $7, $8. Um, but I'm also making a promise to myself to see a movie in the theater, which I don't usually do. Um, the bummer is that I definitely want to see Infinity War, which uh, is coming out this weekend. And, but you can't do it until your card comes and my card won't be here this weekend. So that's kind of uh, a bummer. But um the other thing they charged for the whole year, which um, yeah. was kind of lame. Right. Uh, so, but you can go to any theater. Like, from what I understood, especially in the, it's in the beginning, Movie Pass didn't work on our local theater, and also our local theater, we always reserve seats in advance, which you couldn't do with Movie Pass, but you can do with Cinemia. So you can mm. go online and reserve the seats. Man, so uh, one thing that MoviePass CEO Mitch Lowe said uh, that I read from this article, he says, we just always try different things. Every time we try a new promotion, we never put a deadline on it. So even the four, the, the four movies in a month thing, I'm just saying that could be a promotion that they didn't put a deadline on. And if you really want that, now might be the time to sign up for it. Mm -hmm. Just do yourself, a, do your future self a favor. Yeah, my also other problem is mostly I just go to the movie theater for popcorn, oh, and I'm okay. trying not to eat popcorn. Yeah, they don't include the that with weeks, Movie Pass. So. It's kind of a bummer. They don't include popcorn. No, no that that's their idea. Like they want to sell more popcorn. They should and include soda popcorn because, because yeah. popcorn's good. Right, and a large popcorn costs like I think like seventy five dollars <laughs> now. Or yes, something. <laughs> something like that. Close. Uh, not an exaggeration at all. Uh, Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific. You can always be part of the show by emailing us, uh, particularly if you have a picture or a video of you listening or watching this show. 
Uh, we put those in the show, as you saw earlier. TNW at twit.tv. Subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNW and share our show. Maybe you weren't uh, necessarily interested in the segment about iPads in school, but you know someone who might be interested. Uh, send them to twit.tv slash TNW. Tell them how much you love listening to us. And if you want to tweet at me uh, about what movie I should go to with my new Cinemia membership, I'm at Megan Maroney. But only one movie this month. Only one. And just you. Just me. <laughs> <laughs> By myself. And I'm at Jason Howell. Uh, thanks to everyone who helps put this show together. Josh, of course. Uh, Jammer B. Burke. Patrick was in here. Colleen was in here. Everybody's helping out of the show. We really appreciate your help. And thanks to you for watching each and every week. We'll see you next week on another episode of Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody.